Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to episode 14 of CarmelCast. My name is Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese and CarmelCast is a production of ICS Publications. For more information, you can go to the website at icspublications.org. And today is actually our last episode of the season, season two for CarmelCast. This week is actually a big week for Carmel. Um, it's the feast of all Carmelite saints this week. And then the next day is the, the commemoration of all Carmelite souls. So just like two weeks ago, we had it for the whole church. This week is for Carmel. And so we remember, you know, these holy Carmelites that have passed. You know, maybe not the ones that have been glorified that, you know, you know all about, but the, the lesser known ones, the ones who just live faithfully day in and day out their, their Carmelite vocation and just the impact that that has, even if it's hidden from most eyes. And so we actually decided to interview certain friars um, to get their experience of maybe one of the brothers, one of their a friar that they lived with at some point or that they knew that had a particular impact in their life and was a real example for them and, and for others in the community. So we just thought it'd be a nice way to kind of share that sort of common holiness, but how profound and, and influential it can be um, in our life. So first we're going to actually hear from Father Severio of the Sacred Heart. And this is a real privilege for us because Father Severio is actually the general of the Discalc Carmelite Order, which means he lives in Rome and he's kind of in charge or charged with overseeing the whole order. So our obedience is to him of every Carmelite, Discalc Carmelite in the world. And he was just happened to be making a, a regularly scheduled visitation um, of our province. And so because he was already here, we asked if he would speak a little bit about, about a friar that he knew. And so it's a real gift to be able to now share this testimony of Father Severio um, about a friar named Father Enrico of the Assumption. So my first meeting with a Carmelite friar uh, was uh, when I was uh, 25. I was uh, working in a publishing house in Turin. And a friend of mine uh, introduced me to the novice master of uh, the Tuscany province. So I, I was used to live uh, in a mostly formal uh, milieu. So, with, so um, and I thought that also with a Carmelite father, I, I had to be formal in, in a way. So uh, I, I remember it was uh, at the end of the year, uh, so after Christmas, so I arrived uh, uh, a, a little bit late from Turin to Pisa, where this father lived in the novitiate. So uh, it was nine uh, in the evening. So he, uh, he, he went uh, to open the door. So I, I, I was a little bit in, in embarrassed because it was late. So I said, uh, oh, Father, I'm sorry because I am, I am late. I came by train. So um, I don't know what were you doing? Uh, I thought maybe they, they were in their cells or praying or in the choir. And uh, he said uh, very humbly, uh, and I see simply, uh, we were playing cards. So I, I thought he is joking. So that's uh, maybe he is uh, saying uh, it's, it's a way of saying. But w what kind of a question is? Uh, we are just playing cards. I mean, it's, uh, but so he brought me to the room of the recreation, and they were really playing cards. <laughs> so this was my first experience of the Carmel or Carmelite community. So. I, I, I was surprised, but also I enjoyed this uh, family, familiar atmosphere. So, and then he was so so kind. So he was so concerned about me. Uh, have you uh, had a, a, a supper? So, um, so, and then uh, I can say when I, I uh, knew him uh, better. So. Um, 
he was uh, really a, a man who had an experience of, of Jesus. So that's, uh, it was not so important what he said, but uh, his uh, way of being. So he was like a, a living witness uh, of, uh, of the, the presence uh, of Jesus, of his, uh, uh, of his life. Uh, so that was uh, what uh, really uh, challenged me and in a way opened me a, a window over a different world, a, a, a world where um, uh, these human values, uh, worldly values that were so important for me in this other uh, environment, uh, in, the publishing house, so we're not so important, actually. Uh, uh, Father Enrico, Enrico, and uh, he died uh, just uh, in December last year. He was 92, and so I also I had this uh, uh, grace of uh, uh, presiding the Eucharist of the funerals. So uh, it was amazing because I never saw uh, uh, a funeral with so many people and I mean of every kind of people. So from uh, I mean people, very cultivated people and, and very poor people, very simple people and all. Uh, okay, sad of course, crying uh, for the loss of this, this father. But at the same time, uh, with a sense of peace, of sense of, uh, of joy, we can say. Yeah. Next, we're going to have Father Jude of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, who is actually our provincial. So he's kind of the, the more local superior than Father Severio, but in charge of the whole province, all the monasteries in, in our province. And so it was a great gift that he happened to be here as well, and he shares you know, very much from the heart about a friar that, that a, had a huge impact on him, Father Christopher. Well, one that I remember very well is Father Christopher Latimer. And I met Father Christopher when I was a student in Washington back in the 80s. I think I went to Washington the first time in 1983. I had just made temporary vows. And Father Christopher had been a former prior of the Washington community, and he was the editor of Spiritual Life magazine. At that point, it was a... Um, quarterly edition that came out and he was editing it at the time and he was a very kind man. Uh, he had been a former provincial and as a provincial I can appreciate him because every time I've had to go to the file to look something up and he was involved in it, I know everything's going to be there and everything's going to be precise. So he really did his homework and I appreciate that. I remember him as a very kind man. Uh, he was already in his 60s, I believe, when I met him, and uh, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So he lived in community as long as he could until finally he was so sick that he had to go live in a Catholic nursing home not far from our monastery on Lincoln Road, and it was run by sisters. And they were extremely kind with him and took very, very good care of him. Uh, one of the things I remember about Father Christopher was his kindness. He was a very gentle man. He had a very dry sense of humor, so dry that you didn't know if he was joking or not because he came across very serious. But uh, he was a delight to live with, a uh, very easy person to live with, very prayerful, and uh, was always at the office and mass and so forth, and uh, just a wonderful human being. He. Um, suffered a great deal, I think, at the end of his life from the Parkinson's disease and really ended up in a almost catatonic state, uh, which was a shame to see him suffer like that. But what I remember is that he never complained. He was always very gentle, he was always in good humor, and he was always happy to see anybody who came to visit him. And I remember visiting him, oh, in the mid-90s, and uh, I said, Father Christopher, do you remember me? And he looked at me and said, yes, who could forget you? <laughs> I said, thank you. He passed away, I believe it was in 1995. And um, the little sisters who took care of him really loved him very much. And there was one sister in particular who took care of him. 
and uh, she was going blind from macular degeneration. So several days after he had died and they'd had the funeral and so forth, uh, she was getting her patients into the chapel for mass and she got all of her wheelchair patients in order and got them all situated and then she went and sat down in her pew with the sisters, got her hymnal out, prepared for the hymn, and she looked at the hymn board and she couldn't read anything. It was so blurred that she couldn't see it. And she looked at her hymnal and she couldn't read the hymnal either because her vision was so bad. She had been going to see uh, a doctor uh, about her condition and he said, the only thing you can do at this point is take vitamins for your eyes, which she was doing. And then one night she was so frustrated and tired and she said, oh, Father Christopher, if you're really in heaven, restore my eyesight. And then she kind of forgot about it. So the next day, she went through her whole routine again, and she got her patients in the chapel for Mass, and all the wheelchairs were lined up, and she finally went, and she looked at the hymn board once again, had her hymnal out, and she looked at the board, and again, she couldn't read it. And she looked down at her hymnal, and she was so distressed. And then she lifted her head and looked at the hymn board again, and to her amazement, it went from being blurry to being perfectly clear. And she thought to herself, I can see. I can actually read that. She said, I wonder what happened. And then she remembered her prayer. If you're in heaven, restore my eyesight. And he did, through the grace of God. So she went back to her eye doctor. And the eye doctor thoroughly examined her and said, Sister, you have 20-20 vision. He looked at her and said, what did you do? She said, I didn't do anything except take the vitamins. He said, oh, he said, you did something else, didn't you? And she said, well, I prayed to Father Christopher and asked if he was in heaven to restore my eyesight. And she said, you know what, doctor? He did. So that story has been passed down now these many years since his death. He died in 1995, I believe. He was Father Christopher of the Blessed Sacrament, and he had a great devotion to our Lord of the Blessed Sacrament. And... He's one of my fondest memories of living in Washington. Now we're going to hear a little bit from Father Michael of the Heart of Jesus, who you might remember from the first episode of this season. And he is also the student master of, of our province. Um, and he is going to be sharing about a friar he knew, Father Dominic of the Holy Rosary. Uh, Father Dominic Shearer was one of our older friars who lived at Holy Hill with me when I was a novice and he had been a missionary in the Philippines for uh, I don't know how many years, several years. And uh, he was one of the first missionaries there and was very practical, very hands-on, creative. Uh, whenever there was a need there, he would uh, be clever enough to uh, work out some kind of uh, uh, some means to address the need, mechanical or what have you. And the one thing is that Father uh, Father Dominic was a joyful man. He was uh, a very funny man. There was a certain tenderness about him. As as a young friar, my experience of him was such that he'd had a lot of experience and that he had been maybe uh, tenderized over the course of years by that experience, but also very wise as a consequence. He was someone who, who could make you laugh uh, until you cried. And uh, I enjoyed him especially uh, when the friars would recreate together. One memory I have I'll never forget is our cook, Sister Zita, her father had passed away and the community traveled to northern Wisconsin for the funeral. Uh, and at the end, after the funeral, there was a small reception in the church hall. And I was sitting, eating with many of the other friars and all of a sudden, I heard on the other side of the hall, the widow uh, laughing at the top of her lungs and uh, looking over and seeing that she was with Father Dominic, who apparently had just told her some joke 
and it seemed as if uh, the widow was not aware that she had lost her husband just a few days earlier. That was the kind of person he was. Another uh, thing, perhaps a little silly, that I remember with Father Dominic was that he had uh, loved animals, and he had uh, set up a lovely bird house outside that he had built, but the squirrels would frequently climb up and uh, steal the food that had he put out for the birds. So, being clever, he decided to create a little uh, electrical wire that would run up the pole to prevent any scavengers from going to get the seeds. And this was a very successful uh, technique uh, that, that he employed until one day uh, one of my classmates accidentally uh, touched the wire. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fortunately, yes, he was shocked, but um, but he wasn't he wasn't terribly hurt. Uh, but that was the end of that uh, electronic uh, device he made, anyway. So, but one thing that I remember that stays with me to this day is as you would walk by his uh, his cell, his door would often be open, and he'd be sitting in there, and you could always feel welcome to just knock at the door and say hello. And he would always say to me, uh, keep your balance, keep your balance. Uh, he could always sense when perhaps I was on edge or struggling with uh, difficulty in maintaining, you know, some of the tension of, of our life um, as a young religious. But he, as a former missionary and as someone who had a lot of experience, you could tell that this was... Uh, advice that he has he had lived throughout his life to, to maintain his balance to keep with prayer to remember the big picture in life that when anxiety or fear would get the better part of me he would just kind of remind me um, who was in charge in my life that the lord was in charge and now we're going to hear from father john melka father john of the cross who is one of the friars of the california arizona province um, and who's just a wealth of wisdom about our order. And he's going to share a little bit about um, a friar that had a big impact on him, an Irish friar, Father Brocard. And I believe he had the, the title of St. Therese, so he must have been one of the first ones to have that title of St. Therese. Wow. His sister was a Carmelite nun in La Grey. And the... Um, he came uh, out to California in 1956 with Father Aylby. They were the first two uh, to come from Ireland, not by ship, but by plane. They were the first ones. They uh, arrived at Oakville in November 1956, and I was just enamored with the two of them. One was young, Father Aylby was young, Father Brocard was, we always looked on him as an old man, he was <laughs> probably born old. <laughs> um, but that's the way he was. Um, and he, he just brought uh, respect wherever he went. I remember the, the other fathers would tell me when they went out to a clergy dinner some of the diocesan priests, you know, they'd tap on Father Brocard's shoulder and ask if they could see him to go to confession privately. Mm -hmm. And this happened all the time. Mm -hmm. So he had a, he had a, a, without saying anything, he just was able to show that he was a man of God mm -hmm. and a man of peace. Anyway, we, we loved him, and he was teaching us um, Father Francis was teaching us Gregorian chant, then Father Brocard came over and, and gave us some other lessons in the Gregorian. He studied um, as a young man at the Cistercians in uh, Rock, in Ross Cray uh, in Ireland. Mount St. Joseph was the name of their abbey. And uh, so he had a great love of the liturgy from from the Cistercians, the Trappists, in Ireland. And he 
brought that love of the liturgy to us um, from his own life. Anyway, he, um, I remember him saying mass for us. One day he was saying a private mass in St. Joseph's oratory and we had a, a beehive outside the window and a bee hit him on the head during the mass and I was serving, but I was the only one there that I saw him. And Father Brocard took care of, he raised bees in, in Ireland, if you call it that. But he was very still. He didn't swat it or anything. And I was waiting for the sting and a yelp, but nothing happened. And here this bee was crawling down him and not a, not a flicker on his face. He just bore with him until, and until the, I don't know how, he, how the bee got away. Maybe, <laughs> maybe got inside him. Maybe Father Brokard ate him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was just amazed at how Father Brokard was so, well, he was distracted, I'm sure, saying mass, but the way he, <laughs> isn't that funny, the, the things you remember? Yeah. He died in Ireland. Now, I, I, when I made solemn vows in 61, um, I had no family or relatives there, so he was, I had asked him, he was at the provincial house in Ireland in, in St. Teresa's Clarendon Street, and he came to our house of studies and he did the, the homily, did the homily, said the homily for uh, the profession. Uh, I remember he, I still have the holy card that he gave me. Now we're gonna hear from Brother John Mary, who you've probably seen many times on CarmelCast last season and who was on the episode about John of the Cross this season. Um, and he's going to share a bit about Father Kieran of the Cross, Father Kieran Cavanaugh. Father Kieran Cavanaugh was born in 1928. Um, and when he was young, I think he was 18 years old when he entered the Carmelites. Um, and after his period of initial formation, uh, he went away to Rome to study theology. Um, and it was during that time that he was ordained a priest when he was 27 years old. Um, and then he finished his studies there and then came back to the United States. And shortly thereafter, just a couple of years after, he really began his entire life's work. Uh, Father Kieran, he really, he devoted his entire life to studying and translating the works of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. And this was something that he, he worked on for nearly 50 years of his life, the translations of those works. And it's really think, thanks to him that we have um, those works available in such a, a approachable form um, and just very, yeah, very accurate translations um, of those works in English. And it's interesting because I think Father Kieran is often remembered for, for that academic work that he did um, because he devoted a lot of his time to that. But really that was just a small part of uh, his life and his ministry. Um, what's maybe less known about him was that he, he gave a lot of his time to uh, other forms of ministry, particularly to giving retreats, um, to hearing confessions, doing spiritual direction. He's a very well, like a highly sought after retreat master. Um, and so he really just had a, a great impact on uh, so many people's lives. And I was really blessed. I, I met him, he was much, much later in life. I still remember the first time I met him, we were on retreat and I was so excited to meet this man because I knew he had such a, a reputation in our province. And uh, we were on retreat and I got to sit with him at a meal and I was talking with him and he was sharing some about his, his life. And I remember him saying, uh, he was talking about email and he said, uh, back before email, you could get a lot more work done. He just saw email as, as such a distraction. Um, and I later, and I learned the reason why when I moved to our monastery in Washington, DC, um, I had the privilege to kind of become uh, Father Kieran's secretary, almost uh, informally. So uh, I would help him to answer emails. I would help him to get in contact with people, to print out 
um, homilies, because up until his death, he continued working. He was still writing several books, uh, was still go- leaving every single month to go give uh, re- retreats and give talks to the secular order. And uh, so when I was kind of working as his secretary, I'd help him answer emails. And he, even though he hadn't answered emails for years, he would still get emails just pouring into his inbox from people that he'd met throughout his life. Um, and usually they were just people sharing with him their gratitude for the great impact that he had made on their lives. Um, and it was really a privilege for me to be able to sit and kind of to, to read all of these emails, people telling about their personal experiences of Father Kieran. And um, then I would help Father Kieran answer them. And it was funny because we would take maybe an hour to send just like a three sentence email back to a person because he was very, at this point, he was very slow uh, in, in thinking. And so he'd read through the email several times and we'd go through it and then he'd compose something, just writing some nice word back to, the, to these people. Um, I was also privileged to be with Father Kieran during the last uh, few days of his life. Um, when he began to get sick, um, I was I was very it was just such a blessing. I got to spend uh, many of those hours and those nights with him uh, at his bedside, and uh, it's a it's a really an experience that has had a profound impact on me and uh, one that I'll never forget. Um, I just remember him uh, laying there in bed as he was slowly dying, um, and he just kept his eyes always on this image of Our Lady that was on his wall. And uh, he was going through at times quite a bit of pain. And uh, I found that one of the things that brought him a little bit of relief is we would pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And that was something that really uh, brought him some comfort. And he would sit there for hours in the bed and he would just, we would be praying and he would would see him, even though he couldn't respond anymore, um, he, uh, would still he was still moving the rosary beads, um, and you could just see the faith that this that this man had, um, and how he was really entrusting his his passing and his death um, to our Lord through uh, his blessed mother, and yeah. So at the end of his life, then there were several of us who were there, and uh, we sang the Flos Carmeli and the Salve Regina, and then Father Kieran passed away. Uh, just a, a few minutes after we finished singing, we're, we're there with him praying. Um, and it was such a privilege. And I really, I feel like Father Kieran, um, at the end of his life, really, he kind of passed on uh, his mantle, uh, his love for St. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, and uh, all of his, his ministry and promoting um, their teachings and Carmelite spirituality. I really feel like he's passed that mantle on now to those of us who are students now. Uh, and I just see through his intercession, I hope to continue that work in our province and in the order. Finally, we're going to hear from Brother Emmanuel of the Mother of Mercy, who was on our episode about our Holy Mother, St. Teresa. And he's going to share about a very recently deceased friar, Father John of the Assumption. So the friar that I like to, to speak about, definitely who's made the most impact upon me, is uh, Father John Grennan uh, of the Assumption who I lived with for the past three or two plus years at Holy Hill uh, before his recent passing. And uh, he made a, an impression on me in a number of ways. I know that um, that, that uh, he was a very lively friar, uh, very, very present to the community. Um, but, but I know I, something that always really struck me by him, about him, that, that, uh, that uh, is been a good example for me was his gratitude. I remember um, many times, many times if I did something, even something small for him or, or if someone else did, he was always incredibly thankful. He always made it a point to say, um, I'm just so grateful for, 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 uh, for this friar or for, or for you, Brother Emmanuel, um, it, no matter how small it was. And, and especially this came up, I know, because uh, uh, it, he passed away from from cancer and and something he always he said to me very early on was um, or in in my time at Holy Hill was just how grateful he was for the community in their care for him um, and 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 it, it was never lost on him um, very very faithful friar to to prayer no matter what was going on if he was later on especially during his 
his time when he was battling cancer, he was he always tried to be tried to be present to the to the community at um, at divine office. I remember, and uh, and just <laughs> very very uh, very present to the the friars. Love the love the friars, and and I remember, yeah, just he was always always uh, always there. He and I uh, would banter back and forth because I'm I'm from Eastern Massachusetts, and he's from from South Hadley, Massachusetts, very distinct small town in, in, uh, in, in Western Massachusetts. And he and I would banter a lot back and forth <laughs> about, uh, about the, the politics of Massachusetts. And, and, uh, and, and, and I, uh, I just, yeah, I remember him. <laughs> he always appreciated uh, a lively conversation. He had to, he, in the process of, of battling cancer, he had to, to give up his bladder. Um, his, his bladder had to be taken out, and I remember him saying on a number of occasions, and he really believed it, and 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 made, gave it so much of himself in it was that uh, in the in the process of <laughs> of of uh, of having his bladder removed, uh, he offered it up for our vocations, and um, and it for him and for many of us, it it really seemed to bear fruit. Um, in the middle of it, we were. We've been getting vocations now for the past six or seven years, and and uh, and he always attributed it to well, he, not the in any heroic way, but but he will always appreciated the opportunity to give um, in give of himself in sacri- and sacrifice for for vocations, and uh, and that was always something very uh, he never he never you know, prided himself on it, but he saw it as the Lord's giving him him the opportunity. To support the community, to support vocations, in his own way, and uh, and that was something that struck me very very deeply. I remember as well. Um, but yeah, very uh, very present to the community, very very faithful friar, very honest, um, very joyful, um, and and yeah yeah very <laughs> just a good friar. I'll uh, I'll always remember him. He's always been he was always a very good example to me. Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.